Welcome to Stone Cold Shrews. I'm Brandon Strange with Charlie Palillo and Josh Jordan. Follow them on X at Palillo and at Josh Jordan 975 and read their work on sportsmap.com. We invite you to please click like on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Click the bell for notifications so you know as soon as new content drops. Speak of new content, we'll be doing a postseason matchup preview early next week. And assuming uh, uh, they'll be in the wildcard series, the Astros that is, we'll be reacting to each of the wildcard series games live on YouTube following each game. If you're a Texans fan, the three of us are doing live reactions following every game this season for our Texans on Tap podcast. We did a live breakdown of Texans Vikings on Sunday, and we'll be dropping a Jags Texans preview Thursday. So you can check out all that stuff on our other YouTube channel, Sports Map Texans, or in audio form again on all your favorite podcast apps. Just search Texans on Tap. So, gents, this past week, if not month, has kept with the running theme of Houston season, which has been nothing easy. Uh, the good news is the Astros took three or four from the Angels, and that should mean decreased drama as they host Seattle this week uh, and should imminently clinch the division. Uh, the bad news is now that Jordan's knee is a concern with Joe Espada telling the media Sunday, quote, Jordan is not great. Uh, there's been some illusions since then that they've perhaps dodged a bullet, nothing official from the team yet. Uh, also, side note, Arigetti also suffered from what the team's calling calf cramp. Uh, so we can only hope that's the extent of it. Look, we'll, obviously the headline coming out of the weekend is the bullpen. We'll dig into that stuff in a little bit. But before we do, it's probably worth taking a step back just a bit and digesting the season as a whole as we are in the final week of it. Given the level of expectation that surrounds this team and given the avalanche of injuries that they've had to power through all season. How do you guys grade the accomplishment of what Houston has done to be on the verge of securing yet another division title and postseason berth? I will go with a firm B plus. And for the purposes of our conversation, whenever you happen to be consuming Stone Cold Strohs this week, it's over, right? It would take the biggest final week choke in the history of Major League Baseball for the Astros not to have one thing. As soon as Monday night, or if it was to take another day or two, they are the full season American League West champions for a seventh consecutive year. That's a spectacular achievement. The 2005 parallel of the Tombstone team that started 15 and 30, this team started 12 and 24, 10 games out of first place in June, and the Astros played more quality baseball for a longer stretch than when they were one of the worst teams in the sport over the first six weeks or so. Uh, I'm fond of saying play the course. The Astros extremely fortunate that their course is the American League West. Right? The Astros surge. It also took Seattle falling apart for two months. But if someone opens the door for you and you barge through it, you don't get denied credit or shouldn't get denied credit for barging through. But this is the only division that the Astros could have won this year. Well, darn the luck. It's the division that they are in. That 2005 team went in as a wild card. Fewer wild card teams then, one fewer round to negotiate in the postseason. But the 2005 Astros, we know, wound up in the World Series. In this platinum Astros era, golden era doesn't do it enough justice. All right, the Astros standard, there's the feel of, well, if they don't at least make it to the World Series, hugely disappointing. If they're not in the American League Championship Series, the whole thing's a failure. That's unreasonable, but in the narrow tunnel of 2024, it certainly would feel that way to many, I'm sure, including to all the members of the 2024 Astros who've been around for any of the, the prior seasons. But going back to the playoffs again, in all likelihood, having to survive that best of three to even get into the division series for the first time as a division champ, it's going to be rough sledding. Are they likely to make it back to the World Series, much less win it? No, they're not. Getting back to an eighth consecutive ALCS, probably not going to happen, but probably is not definitely. And the Astros having played themselves into a position where it is possible, that's why I go B+. Plus. Uh, postseason grade separately, the fact that they're in the softest division in baseball keeps me from giving them A- minus or A. I'll go a minus up the ante just a little bit. If we just look back, remember Dana Brown is being asked questions about being a seller. And and he was just like, no, I, I've been on too many good clubs. This club is too good that, that we're going to have to sell. They're, they're going to turn it around. They're going to hit. They're going to pitch better. And it all happened for a lot of different reasons for it. And I mean, the injuries they got past with Javier going down and 
young guys stepping up, Eric Getty and Hunter Brown looking like a bright future for you. It's I think they did an incredible job. And it, it's just a reminder. You look at what the Rangers did last year, coming out of nowhere and winning the World Series. And and where are they this year? You know, back to where they were before, not making the postseason again. It just it's it's hard to to climb the mountain and win a World Series, but it's even harder to maintain it and keep being a contender every single year. So I give the Astros a lot of credit. And uh, I'm impressed. It's just We should have known it, the grit with these guys. And, and not having Kyle Tucker for that huge chunk of the season, they still managed to, to find ways to win ball games. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give them an A-. I, I'm impressed with they, what they did this year. And it, it gives me a little confidence that maybe this window isn't closing anytime soon. Maybe, maybe they can keep doing this for the next couple, three years. No reason it's not in play, especially in this division. I just think it's part of the fun, actually, for fans and some bloviating members of the media, I suppose, to overreact to most things, good or bad, that this team should have quit on a season and sold. You know, they were within a month of bad baseball beyond 12 and 24, where the ditch would have been too deep. But the Major League Baseball season is so long, and that they got within a game of the Mariners by the All-Star break after being 10 games out, not even a month earlier. Um, uh, plenty of egg on faces to go around. I suppose Astros fans with it will happily wipe it off, sprinkle a little salt and pepper and, and down that, uh, maybe with a side of crow to eat as well. Yeah, and going to the to the point of not diminishing the accomplishments of winning the division, Seattle's implosion, Josh, as you mentioned, could have opened the door for the reigning champs to make a move as well. Rangers were not able to overcome their injuries. Texas did not sell at the deadline. So they ended up being in this purgatory of not being competitive, but also not being able to bring in any assets that would allow them to help retool for next year. So uh, Texan or Astros did stay the course and, you know, now they find themselves on the verge of another postseason berth. So as we're talking about injuries and discomfort and the column of discomfort guys, the bullpen, gave up seven runs on seven hits and three innings in Sunday's implosion on the hands of the angels of all teams. Um, let's talk about the bullpen. Caleb Wart, his ERA has ballooned over five in the past week. Taylor Scott went, has gone down with a sprained back. Hector Neris's ERA is the highest it's been in over a month. Ryan Presley has given up earned runs in two of his last four appearances. Josh Hader has blown three of his last 10 save opportunities. On a very scientific scale, of one to 10, one being Brad Lidge against prime Albert Pujols, 10 being 2022 postseason Presley. What's your confidence level in Houston's bullpen just a week out of the postseason? I'm going to take a macro view on this and as a result, give it a six. There's vulnerability there. Josh Hader has not had a good season. I know he had the 29 consecutive saves and it's a factual stat, but there is an immense amount of softness to it that depending where we go in the conversation, I'll shine further light on it. Uh, Josh Hader has been a rather middling closer this season, and that's a kind of important role. Four years, $76 million more attached to it, by the way. But for 2024, Hader's just a closer. Ryan Presley uh, had been pretty darn solid over the last month or so after having looked shaky himself for a good while and then a stint on the IL. Uh, Brian Abreu has been shaky too often for too long now, for the best of what we've seen from these guys. Taylor Scott had faded pretty much since the All-Star break. I don't know cause and effect from when he went three innings in that opener game. He hasn't been the same guy and now down injured, probably not in the mix. Uh, I just think Hector Neris is a little bit of a ticking time bomb. Maybe time runs out on it before it detonates. But that's the fourth best reliever in the Astros bullpen. And then you get into the situational use of Caleb Ferguson from the left side. Uh, Brian King now, I think, is on this playoff roster uh, from the left side. Uh, Ort, small number of innings, so a couple of bad outings really can mushroom the, the earned run average. But he's your fifth, sixth guy out of the bullpen. In the macro, the Yankees' bullpen's very questionable. Their closer, Clayton Holmes, lost the job. That's how bad he was for a long period of time. The Orioles' bullpen is very shaky. Now, the Cleveland Guardians' bullpen is by far the best in the American League, and they have a great closer in Emmanuel Classe. The Astros have a closer in Josh Hader, whose latest failure on Sunday 
You know, he had the 29 consecutive saves. Well, now he's blown three since then. But throw in all the ninth inning home runs he's given up this year, a fistful of them in tie games. 33 saves, nine of them have been one-run saves where you come in where you don't have a safety net. That Josh Hader, 13 of his 33 saves, he came in with a three-run lead. Ooh, a save because you didn't completely suck rotten eggs and blow a three-run lead in one inning. It's not like Josh Hader comes in with two outs in the seventh inning or routinely gets four out saves. He comes in for the ninth inning, and he has had mostly marshmallowy soft opportunities. I mentioned Classe, who has been incredible. He has 17 one-run saves to Hader's nine. Hader's blown four saves, non-blown saves, the ninth inning home runs that he gave up to lose games to Cal Raleigh, to Logan Ohapi, to Christian Vasquez, to Michael A. Taylor. Class A's 46 out of 47 with an ERA under one going into the final week of the season. Josh Hader's given up 12 home runs in 68 and third innings of work. There's not another pitcher in baseball this season in the closer's role who's given up double figures. Damn right there's a concern level with Josh Hader in postseason baseball. And the way Abreu has been a little dicey. Postseason Presley's been damn near perfect. Okay, he's not in the closer's role now. But I still think overall they have good depth when you look at the other guys, a part of that Guardians bullpen if the Astros get into a matchup with Cleveland uh, in the in the second round. Yeah, confidence level. I'm, I'm near Charlie, somewhere between a six and a seven. I, I guess I'll start with Presley first. You know, last year, there was a reason that they decided after the season to, to go get Hater. You know, Graveman got hurt. There were other reasons. But Presley wasn't quite what he used to be. He was great in the postseason, as Charlie mentioned. But, you know, in 21 and 22, he had an ERA before th- uh, below three. Last year, the, the ERA goes up to 358. And that's probably what gave the Astros some concerns. Like, maybe we need somebody a little more dominant in that role. And then we look at this season, Presley, ERA, 3-6. So 358 last year, 36 now. This just might kind of be who Ryan Presley is at this stage in his career. But what's kind of disappointing is, you know, they go get Hader to try and get that dominant guy. He had a 128 ERA last year. This season, his ERA is higher than Ryan Presley's. It's 367. Maybe you can point to the innings pitched. He only pitched 56 and a third last year. He's at 68 and two thirds this year. But I mean, 12 innings, that's not a, a huge amount. But I think that will be important maybe to, you know, to get him a little bit of rest here if they can clinch quickly and get that arm, try and get all these arms as rested as possible as they hopefully head to the postseason. So that's kind of where I am is that haters just kind of come in and become like another Presley instead of being a guy that's that that one step more dominant that I think the Astros were hoping for. The positive is, though, who knows? Next year, Hader could have an ERA in the ones again. You know, he's had some up and down seasons. So, you know, maybe he comes back and he's much better next year. But as we go into this postseason with what we've seen from Hader, you have to be a little concerned. It, it He gives up home runs pretty easily. And I hate to bag on him because when he does come in with those big, uh, big cushions where they have a pretty good lead, you want him to come in and just fire fastballs and not walk anybody. And if you give up a solo home run, no big deal. Just get out of there with the win. But I'm a little worried with him. That slider that he tries to backdoor, sometimes it gets a little too much of the plate to righties and, and they can crush it. And the fastball is not as unhittable as you would think for somebody that throws 97 miles an hour. So I'm, you know, I'm a little bit optimistic, but I'm not so like, oh, wow, we, we have a lights out bullpen like we did in 22. That's just not the case anymore. They're good, but they're not dominant. They're, they're not great. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be enough. Yeah, haters generally tough to hit, but when guys hit him too often, they hit it a long way. And you alluded to it, Josh. He does walk guys. And, you know, uh, walking a two-run homer, that's a good way to blow a a one-run save opportunity as he's done, what, three of his last 10 outings. So there's vulnerability there. But 2022 was just amazing and historic. The Astros now, they're just another team in contention. They're just another team with a bullpen that's pretty good. But looking to the wild card round, unless Cleveland utterly falls apart and the Astros win out this week, right? the Royals' bullpen has been a season-long mess. Uh, the Twins, Yohan Duran, has not been quite as good as he's been the last couple of years. Um, their bullpen's good, uh, not great. 
Uh, Seattle still alive for the wild card. Has blown multiple games with his bullpen in the last week, along with Julio Rodriguez, one of the lamest base running uh, bonehead plays you, you'll, you'll ever see. Um, and then there's Detroit. A.J. Hinch's Tigers starting the final week of the season 26-11 and 11 over the last 37 games, but momentum dies the day you start that best of three. But the Tigers have a good bullpen. And while on the subject, Tarek Skubal pitches Tuesday for Detroit. You're an Astros fan. Want the Tigers but want the Tigers to have to win this Sunday, the last day of the season, and have to use Scoobal because that would take him out of the wildcard series unless pitching on three days rest if there was a game three to decide it next Thursday. Yeah, and getting back to um, Hater for just a second, it's tough to put innings and usage on Hater's inconsistency considering that he started off the season this way. He started off shaky, as did the the entire bullpen. So this is not something that's a new occurrence or something that we can point at to to usage and, and maybe just a tired arm. And Charlie, when you when you talk about macro views and speaking of a guy, of guys named Abreu, uh, the season has been so long that the Jose Abreu saga seems almost another lifetime ago at this point. Uh, John Singleton uh, is hitting 290 for the month of September with a 947 OPS. We've seen him string together some nice runs this season. We know he's not, you know, a, a, a long-term answer at first, but he has been uh, better than you could have anticipated. Um, you know, Yiner Diaz has had a great season. Um, his bat has come back to life over the past week after falling into a slump after that Oakland series. Uh and then, you know, part of this conversation, Vic, Victor Caratini, he's stayed steady as a hitter all season, hovering in that, you know, mid 270s with his batting average. Not a lot of walks or power. But that also seems to be Houston's offense in a nutshell for large swaths of the season, uh, especially outside of the uh, the five spot and lower. Is, is Houston's answer at first base for the rest of this season and postseason just finding ways to platoon Diaz and Singleton at first with a combination of Caratini at catcher? Oh, there's no alternative. It's very simple. John Singleton is quite a story, and we'll see how he hits against postseason teams' caliber pitching. But against right-handed pitching, he'd been stout. OPS of 776 for the season. I mean, doesn't make you an elite first baseman, but that's totally playable. Obviously, leaps, bounds, and then more leaps and bounds – beyond what you were getting out of uh, Jose Abreu all those decades ago. So Singleton against right-handed pitching on merit absolutely is in there every game. Now, the platoon component happens to work very well on this in that Victor Caratini is a switch hitter, but he has been way better against left-handed pitching. John Singleton against left-handed pitching is a joke, right? His personal renaissance, okay, He's batting 149 against left-handed pitching. You want John Singleton nowhere near the batter's box against a left-handed pitcher unless you're down to a last out, Dubon is up, and you need a two-run homer. And maybe Singleton gets lucky. He has two home runs against left-handers and 70-some-odd at-bats. But Singleton against lefties is overmatched. Caratini, it's only 53 at-bats. But he's batting 359 against left-handed pitching. So Caratini is in there against the lefty. Singleton sits. Singleton's in there against the righty. Caratini sits. Simple as that. The decision is... Who catches, who plays first base uh, against the lefty? It's been Caratini catching Kikuchi for the most part. I would guess they stick with that. I don't think there's a clearly better catcher or first baseman defensively between Diaz and Caratini. I would lean to Diaz as the catcher, Caratini the first baseman when they're both in the lineup. And that makes a lot of sense. I just Other than I wonder Kikuchi. How, I wonder how the Astros see it with – it almost feels like they trust Caratini a little more behind the plate. I think that's why they used him to work with Kikuchi, the new guy coming into the team. So I'm like, are we going to get some of that Maldi type stuff that we got last year where it's like, well, we want Caratini behind the plate because he has more experience and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know the answer to that. We'll find out here soon enough. But that's the only thing that makes me think, would they, would they play Yiner a little more at first base because they want Caratini behind the plate catching? Do they trust him a little more than Yiner? I, I don't know. We'll see, but you know, we'll get to this later. It, it seems pretty obvious that the DH spot is going to be occupied by Jordan Alvarez, where we've seen Yiner Diaz DH a lot this season. I don't think that's going to be an option for them going forward. Yeah, I think Yiner has been the primary catcher all season. I would not deviate from that in the postseason, but we know whoever's catching is a hell of a lot better the player than what Maldonado was uh, for them last season. So uh, either way, is a substantial upgrade behind the plate. 
And all you Maldi truthers can at Palillo, at Palillo for that conversation because I want no part of it. That's going to be it for part one of Stone Cold Strohs. We have another video dropping on Tuesday. We're going to dig into the postseason roster, so keep an eye out for that. And until then, go Strohs.